All right, here we are again in the locker room. Uh, we're gonna take something uh, on today. It's a little bit different. We're gonna do uh, neck and, and back pain, um, which we tend to think of that as a, a, as a, a structural problem, a mechanical problem. Uh, uh, and uh, if we can just figure out, you know, sort of the, the, the structural issue or what mechanical issue is uh, causing it that we'll be able to cure it. But we frequently fail in doing that, so there must be something else going on. So um, this, this format has been about threat and safety uh, and the way our body presents in terms of its physiology when we're in threat and safety. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try to uh, tie in uh, neck and back pain into this, uh, this uh, model. Um, you know, we've used the polyvagal theory as well as the global cytokine theory to explain a lot of things, and most of these sessions have been around COVID and explaining that, but we've also, you know, dug into neurodegenerative disorders and mental health disorders and, and how threat and safety uh, plays out uh, in our physiology and all of those uh, illnesses and disease processes. Uh, but today we're actually going to uh, talk about something that we feel is more of a musculoskeletal kind of problem uh, and perhaps, uh, you know, sway that opinion um, or at least expand the, uh, the, the way that we look at uh, neck and back pain. So let's, uh, let's actually just start with a skeleton. Got a lot to cover, so I'm gonna go fairly fast, try to give a quick orientation here. Here's the back of the skull. This is where our face would be. Uh, the top joint is kind of a rocker joint where the skull uh, connects with the first uh, vertebral body here, the first vertebrae. Uh, the second uh, vertebrae, right below it, cervical vertebrae, has a little bit more of a rotational component to it and has no uh, disc, whereas if you look at the, the segments coming down here, these little gray areas, every other segment has a disc in it until we get down to the sacrum here, which is uh, more of a solid fused block of bone. These segments have fused together. And then we actually get down to the coccyx here where the segments are no longer fused, but there are no discs and there's just a little bit of motion down in, in the tailbone. So, um, Quick orientation, cervical spine has uh, seven vertebrae, and it has this gentle curve here, nice little shock absorbing kind of curve uh, called a cervical lordosis. The thoracic segment, this blue area, has uh, 12 vertebrae in it, uh, and each one of them has a, a disc between, uh, between the vertebral bodies, between the blocks of bone, and it has a curve going the opposite direction. So it has a, a, a kyphotic curve, so lordosis, kyphosis. Then we come down to uh, the low back, the lumbar spine, and typically we have um, five um, vertebral segments uh, here. Uh, with uh, a nice uh, curve as well, a nice shock absorbing curve here called a lordosis. And then as we get down to the sacrum, it's that fused segment we were talking about, uh, big block of bone, but it has a little bit more of this kyphosis kind of curve. So all in all, the curves combine to balance our head over the center of our, our pelvis, which is really very nice. It's very energy efficient. Uh, to be like uh, to be like that and it's also very protective. We've got this little kind of s-shaped curve That's uh, nice and shock absorbing now um, Let's reorient out here to the yellow little things coming out. Those are nerve roots and Those are the the nerves the spinal cord down, goes down the, the center column of the spine is protected by this ring of bone and then the nerve roots peel out and go out, uh, you know, down our arms and legs and, you know, in, into our abdomen and they innervate our muscles and our skin and our organs so we can sense things and move things and, uh, and are, are wired back up uh, uh, to the brain. Um, so let's talk about these little gray things, these little discs, because so much of what we sort of perceive as uh, pathology and the source of back pain has uh, a model and not completely, you know, um, inclusive or expansive enough, but has a model uh, by which, you know, the discs um, sort of 
uh, are the centerpiece of, uh, of neck and, and back pain. So these discs are, let's put this down for just a second. Um, these discs are, um, <clears throat> they're little shock absorbers uh, and that uh, allow when we're you know, walking or running uh, to absorb sort of the pounding uh, so that we just don't have sort of a rigid pole vibrating our brain as we're doing everything. So they're nice little shock absorbers and when we're 16 years old, they're not like a nice plump grape and they do a great job of shock absorbing. They have a fairly tough exterior kind of ligamentous structure that contains uh, them. In the middle, they're filled with uh, essentially a jelly. So they're a lot like a jelly donut. And that jelly is really the thing that's able to uh, sort of dissipate these forces uh, uh, moving up and, you know, moving up and down. And in fact, the discs are very resilient when they're loaded you know, with that neutral spine that we just demonstrated a, uh, a second ago. Where the discs get into trouble is when we do some asymmetrical loading. And typically asymmetrical loading involves uh, us flexing forward and perhaps lifting something somewhat uh, heavy. So when we uh, flex forward on this, uh, on this jelly donut and we compress the front of the disc, so let's just do this, and you can kind of see how we're pinching the front of this disc when I jam it forward, and you can see the distraction on the back side of the disc when I do that. So when we compress the front of the disc, the jelly, there's a little, you know, a pressure gradient that's created in the disc that makes the jelly bulge towards the back, okay? Uh, push it down and bulge towards the back. Uh, and it, that can result under more uh, significant forces or perhaps as the containment starts to uh, age and degenerate, uh, where you can actually take the jelly and push it out of the center of the disc where it uh, pro uh, creates a prolapse of the disc. And that's been demonstrated uh, here. This is out the side. It's usually out the back towards the nerve roots, unfortunately. Uh, and so if it does uh, prolapse out the back, or in some cases the jelly will extrude or squirt out the back, it gets out around the nerve roots and creates not only pressure on the nerve roots, but inflammation on the nerve roots. And that in the leg or in the low back down into the leg would be termed sciatica, or more generally we, return that, we term that radiculitis or radiculopathy, meaning nerve root um, uh, irritation or pathology. So that's, uh, that's kind of the, 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 the classic thing that we think about when somebody injures their, their back. Did they injure one of these discs and is that the, the source of the pain? And if it's going down the leg, is it, you know, is it sitting on a nerve root causing uh, pain and a numbness and weakness in, in an extremity? Um, the other phenomenon that's closely related to that is let's say you don't actually create one of these um, big bulges coming out, but you just repetitively over a lifetime are bending and stooping and doing this and you cause sort of little micro migrations or little fissures through the containment of the donut and the disc material gets pushed to the back and then it sits back there and it eventually dehydrates. Um, and when this big plump raisin, our big plump grape dehydrates, it sort of flattens out in bulgy, wrinkly looking raisiny disc. Uh, and it's not as good at uh, shock absorbing. Um, and so that, that sets up a, a little different scenario. You can imagine uh, along this, this uh, <coughs> tower, you have uh, a lot of supporting ligaments uh, that prevent things from slipping and sliding too much. Uh, and if, the, uh, if you collapse the grape down into a raisin and the segments get closer, those ligaments get a little loose. And when they're loose, if you've got a little bit of micro motion there, the body may not like that. Or in some cases, you know, you can get sort of more gross slipping forward. Um, the body tends to want to do something to stabilize uh, this micro motion. So it grows some extra bone. So you're gonna see a little extra bone growth um, you know, off of the vertebral bodies, but also off of these little joints in the back, I got my finger in one right there, that guide the motion of the spine. And uh, as the disc, you know, uh, the raisin bulges out the back and the ligament 
buckles out the back and you get a little extra bone growth here and a little extra bone growth there as we age. Sometimes all of that takes up too much space and starts crowding out the nerve roots and the nerve roots uh, when they aren't getting you know enough good blood flow with activity because the, the, there's uh, the space is too tight they start to squawk and you know that's the uh, term spinal stenosis or spinal narrowing uh, and when it crowd, crowds out the nerve roots it will you know give you uh, extremity symptoms so that's sort of the degenerative model that we talk about and a lot of times it'll get de uh, termed degenerative disc disease or degenerative joint disease if it's re referring to the uh, to the facet joints and uh, you know sometimes those facets are actually truly an arthritic degenerative facet and they can be causing uh, an amount of back pain but by and large uh, you know the degenerative process in the spine is no no different than wrinkling it's something we expect as we age uh, and uh, it doesn't necessarily represent a painful segment any more than a wrinkle uh, represents uh, uh, pain, you know, pain in our, in our skin. So we have to be very careful about interpreting uh, the spine the same way we might interpret a degenerative hip or a degenerative knee because they, they really aren't quite the, uh, quite the uh, same animal. Um, and we get into trouble when we um, uh, start pursuing uh, uh, degenerative spine as if that's the, um, the, the source of, uh, of pain. Um, we can, uh, you know, end up doing uh, extra procedures to the spine that aren't helpful and have some risk or uh, decide that one segment looks particularly bad and maybe it should be fused and then there's a big sequelae of losing a motion segment in the spine of the stress it puts on the rest of the spine over uh, years. And, uh, and, and sometimes it, it sets up a domino effect of uh, increasing deterioration uh, in the spine. And particularly if it wasn't the right diagnosis in the first place, that's, that's kind of a tragedy to end up uh, going uh, down that path. Um, so I think um, with that, I would like to you know, go up to the board and, uh, and we'll uh, talk about uh, the other sources of back pain uh, other than the, stru uh, the structural ones uh, that are uh, commonly overlooked. And, and as uh, you know, we mentioned that uh, the majority of neck and back pain is not structural. And in fact, the majority of neck and back pain is actually uh, myofascial pain, which kind of leads us into our model of threat uh, versus uh, uh, safety and the physiology of those two very different states in our body. So if we come over here, now let's uh, kind of start with this cartoon. Um, let's clean that up just a little bit here. sure we can see this nerve root coming between the two vertebrae. Okay, so um, here's uh, our two blocks of bone, uh, one vertebral body stacked on another, and then in the center here we have this nice uh, gelatinous core, the nucleus pulposus, um, that acts as a nice shock absorber and allows uh, some motion in the spine uh, back here is a little facet joint articulating with each other and here the nerve root is sliding right out the hole and potentially going down the leg. So if we go to this, the, the cartoon right below, we can see we flexed forward, we're pinching the front of this disc and we have a pressure gradient going from front to back and in this particular case We've demonstrated the jelly having squirted out of the center of the disc and it's now out into the spinal canal sitting on a nerve root causing pressure and inflammation and then that hurts and creates that uh, sciatica pain going down through the buttock into the leg, perhaps some numbness, perhaps some weakness in the leg. Now just real quickly, let's go up here and pretend that this disc has dehydrated out, everything's settled down, and now we're going to get a little extra bone formation off of 
the disc here and a little extra bone coming off the back of the vertebral bodies. Sometimes the, the disc itself even gets calcified. A little extra bone formation off of the facet joint. The top facet there. And all of a sudden you can see the room for that nerve root gets kind of dicey and, and sometimes it, it will start to squawk at us. Um, so that, that's, you know, a basic uh, model of kind of degenerative spine disease and, all, and, uh, and if you end up with a, a big uh, extruded or prolapsed disc, yeah, that can be painful. If you end up with a lot of bone spur formation uh, and crowding out of nerve roots, you can also have some pain and neurologic dysfunction associated with that. But if you don't actually have um, those things, uh, you just have some degenerative changes in your spine, that's really not a good indication for a procedural intervention. And in general, we tend to think of things that require procedural intervention are things like major trauma, where you've broken a bone or torn some ligaments and you had some gross instability. That's, that can be an indication for uh, surgery. Uh, progressive neurologic deficit, whether it's minor from these little nerve root things or major from like a, uh, the spinal cord being uh, uh, pinched and crowded out. That's a good indication for surgery. If you have an infection in the spine, either in the disc space, the bones, or perhaps even an abscess in the canal, that's an indication for surgery. In general, infections in the spine are needed. They need to be treated surgically as well with antibiotics. If you have tumor in the spine uh, or in the spinal cord, that very well may be an indication uh, for doing um, surgery. But, um, you know, by, by and large, the majority of neck and back pain doesn't really require a procedure or any surgery. And we're talking vast majority, probably, you know, less than 5% of all neck and back pain really needs to have uh, anything done from a procedural or a surgical standpoint. Um, having said that, let's move on to what is uh, the majority of neck and back pain, and that is myofascial pain. So we got another little cartoon here, uh, and you can see uh, that the, the red areas are the, uh, are the musculature and the fascia that tends to get uh, activated uh, and, and cause myofascial symptoms. Myofascial symptoms can mimic a disc injury, they can mimic a facet arthritis, they can even mimic a nerve root problem um, because sometimes you do get uh, numbing, tingling sensations uh, with myofascial pain. The myofascial distribution can go all the way up into the, the jaw muscles, the, the uh, muscles of the head, but um, tends to present more in the muscles along uh, the spine. So the big strap muscles of the neck, uh, the levator scapula muscle that goes kind of from the neck out to the tip of the scapula, uh, the trapezius muscles get, are probably the ones that get most involved out of all of them. Um, these long strap muscles of the thoracic spine and lumbar spine are involved. Uh, the quadratus lumborum and the low back is frequently involved. And even down into our gluteal musculature, particularly these piriformis muscles. And the piriformis muscle actually sits right on top of the sciatic nerve. So you can imagine if it uh, is involved, it may uh, create some irritation of the sciatic nerve and, and give us sciatica. So that can very much rep, uh, replicate uh, some, a nerve root problem in the back. And we get them confused sometimes um, when we see degenerative changes in the back and forget to think about uh, the sciatic nerve in the butt and the piriformis muscle. So uh, what, what actually causes this myofascial phenomenon that is, uh, is so extremely common and so much overlooked in terms of the source of neck and back pain? Well, there's really three, three things going on. And let's, let's start with this idea that myofascial pain is part of uh, the experience of chronic threat and stress. Um, but let's go back to how we evolved over millions of years. Uh, our threat-stress uh, 
system was really designed uh, to run from a tiger in the jungle, okay? So let's imagine I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm going about my uh, picking berries and stuff and all of a sudden I see a tiger in the jungle. And our first instinct is a brief moment of freeze while we make a decision about what we're gonna do. Um, and so in that freeze uh, posture, we uh, assume a protective posture. So we tend to go like this. So I've just activated my shoulder muscles. I've brought them up. Um, so we're getting the levator scapula and the trapezius activated. I have brought my head and neck forward and down as if to protect them with uh, my shoulders. So I'm getting more of these kind of strappy muscles involved in the neck. I've bent forward a little bit, right? And I've kind of preloaded down uh, into uh, my butt muscles, uh, getting ready to, uh, to take off and run or do something, right? And so now I'm no longer in a balanced posture with this. I'm forward. My back muscles are working a little bit harder to hold me uh, upright. Um, I've slightly protected the vital organs in this position. That's our threat position. So that is, you know, that uh, makes some sense uh, why we would do that, particularly in the jungle. But if we're under chronic stress at work every day and we're sitting at a computer all day long, uh, and these muscles, maybe we don't even notice they're uh, being activated, are activated chronically. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing, and you can you know, see how they might start to fatigue and squawk and, and get uh, uh, tired over time. So um, that postural change is significant, right? Uh, the other thing though that comes with that postural change is some increase in, in uh, muscle tension and we all have a sense of you know that muscle tension phenomenon. Well when we're having to run from the tiger it's really nice to have our reflexes jacked up. Uh, we are a little faster and we can jump a little higher and we can duck and dart you know uh, and hopefully escape harm. Um, but uh, well, let me just go back. When we reset our, our reflexes, the, the spindles in the muscle control kind of the tension within the muscle. And when those muscle spindles become uh, overactivated, uh, uh, then um, we're gonna feel more muscle tension over time. And occasionally, you know, a muscle spindle, or at least that's what I think happens, will actually you know kind of go through a, a, a little bit of a freak out and and we'll all of a sudden feel something and uh, oh god something went out uh, we have a little uh, spasm and can't move right for a few days and before everything kind of eventually melts back to, to normal so so we have uh, protective posturing we have increased uh, muscle tension in our body and and that over time if it goes on chronically just like if you were carrying a bucket of water for too long, your bicep would start to ache. You're gonna start to get some aching in these muscles. Well, we do something that complicates that as well. Under a threat, under attack, we vasoconstrict and we preferentially want to deliver our blood to the vital structures for um, fight and flight. And so our beta receptors help to keep our heart uh, perfused and our diaphragm perfused and our brain stem and even, you know, like the, the uh, more reactive part of our brain tends to stay online, but we vasoconstrict and we turn off the neocortex of the brain, the distinctly human part of our brain where we have really expansive language and, and uh, we can solve calculus problems and the part of our brain that really helps us be pro-social and connect uh, and as that's really important for survival over the long run, but uh, that being pro-social in a tiger battle, it doesn't really help us to try to bond with the tiger. So that goes offline. So we turn a lot of uh, structures offline. Let's shut that down. Um, to preferentially deliver uh, blood where it uh, uh, needs to uh, needs to go uh, for our survival. Uh, 
and how we deliver the blood to the muscles that, we're, that we need or the ones that we're using. They preferentially dilate the blood vessels up and we deliver more uh, resources to the muscles that we need for fight and flight. Well, again, if we're sitting in an office uh, at a computer all day and we're never uh, actually uh, getting up and moving, uh, those blood vessels will just stay constricted all day. And even though we have increased uh, muscular activity, uh, the blood flow isn't as good. And now you have a metabolic imbalance, right? You're, you're burning more resources without delivering as many nutrients and as much oxygen, let alone pulling away the metabolites. And, uh, you, and, and you know what tissues feel like when they don't get enough blood flow. So, so the vasoconstriction thing when we're not actually moving complicates the um, postural and, and muscle tension phenomenon and makes those muscles hurt even more. Okay, so those are two legs of the stool. The third leg of the stool is the thing that we're always talking about, which are these um, threat cytokines, the pro-inflammatory, the threat cytokines that uh, activate our, our pain uh, sensation, our nociception, uh, and they are also the catabolic cytokines. So let's talk about them real quickly. And, and I should mention too that this, this muscle tension, postural oxygen delivery thing it has more to do with the muscles, so the myo part of myofascial pain, whereas the um, fascial system is is very much uh, uh, part of this uh, cytokine system. The connective tissues of our body are very much a part of the cytokine system. I would argue they are the primary part of our cytokine system. So the fascia that envelops our muscles and envelops our bones and envelops our organs produces uh, cytokines. The um, uh, sort of uh, uh, counterpart in the brain, the glial tissue, produces a ton of cytokines and uh, our blood, which actually I learned in med school is considered a connective tissue. Our blood, particularly our white blood cells in the blood uh, produce uh, a lot of uh, cytokines. So, so the, the cytokine system is more the fascial aspect of this myofascial pain phenomenon. Um, so let's talk about them. We've been talking for months now about you know, the inflammatory and catabolic cytokines and today we added into the mix um, get this up here the no susceptive cytokines they're all the same okay so it's they're all out of the three agen or the threat cytokine package of cytokines so um, so we're going to have increased pain uh, in this state uh, throughout our fascial tissues uh, from these uh, cytokines flowing. Now the inflammatory aspect of these cytokines, it engages uh, uh, not, uh, not only inflammatory pathways such as like prostaglandins, the stuff that uh, ibuprofen works on, but it also causes white cells to migrate uh, towards areas that are inflamed. Uh, but overall, the, the inflammation, just like in COVID and ARDS, uh, the inflammatory response in going to kill a virus can cause collateral damage in our own, uh, in our own tissues. So the inflammation in and of itself can cause some degeneration in our tissues. But the other thing we always want to remember is that these pro-inflammatory and pro-nociceptive cytokines are also the catabolic cytokines. They are uh, strategic uh, for our fuel supply under fight and flight. And so our degenerative uh, processes are frequently uh, uh, not just uh, uh, mediated by inflammation, they're also mediated by uh, catab catabolism or breakdown of tissue. And the strategy of the breaking down of the tissue is to pro provide fuel for the threat, the attack, the fight, and the flight. So um, uh, th that we pointed out in, in uh, a number of brain disorders is probably the process by which we see neurodegenerative problems in the brain, but it's also the process by which we see degenerative uh, uh, things going on in our, in our bodies as well. So um, catabolism is mobilization of tissue and not 
just to break them down, but to mobilize them for fuel. And specifically, we need the fuel for fight and flight. We don't have time to stop at McDonald's when the tiger is chasing us. So uh, initially we burn glucose. Uh, that's in our blood and in our muscles. Um, once the glucose starts to you know, dry up, we mobilize more glucose by mobilizing something called glycogen from the muscles and, and, uh, and from uh, the liver. And when the glycogen is starting to get used up, we need an, another energy source. And so we've talked in past lectures that fats are a good energy source. We can take fats and break them down into glycerol and fatty acids, and the glycerol can go into the pathway to produce more glucose. Uh, so we can uh, get after some fat for some additional fuel for the fight and flight. We can also break down proteination, proteinaceous tissues. So those being, you know, the structural things, um, uh, ligaments, tendons, uh, you know, muscles, things like that. Um, and there are specific amino acids in these proteins that can go into a pathway to create more uh, glucose. Um, but let's talk about this one, proteoglycans. So proteoglycans are uh, a major structural um, um, ingredient uh, in our cartilage, so the surface of our joints, in our tendons, uh, in our ligaments, uh, and they uh, provide kind of a matrix by which uh, uh, the proteins can strengthen uh, everything uh, and hold, hold them together. They have other properties as well in terms of compression and flexibility and things, things like that. So um, proteoglycans, glycans, proteo, meaning protein, it has a protein backbone, okay? And then attached to the protein backbone are glycans, and glycans are simply car simple carbohydrates, okay? So these guys are just, you know, ripe. If you were sitting there strategizing, you know, okay, I need some fuel for the fight and flight, and I can go after fats, I can go after denser proteins, and I can go through this pathway to get some glucose. Um, that's, that is somewhat resource expensive to break those tissues down. But to go after proteoglycans is actually relatively simple. All, all I gotta do is cleave off a few of the carbohydrate molecules, and they easily convert to glucose. So people under chronic threat and stress who are going through this uh, uh, process of throwing out these uh, uh, threat cytokines, triagens, are going to go after proteoglycans uh, to uh, produce some fuel for the fight and flight. So gonna tend to see early degenerative arthritis as we rob the cartilage. Gonna tend to see um, tendonitis type things, particularly enthesitis where the tendons insert into the bone. So rotator cuff problems, uh, tennis elbow problems, hip pain out here on the outside of the hip where a lot of tendons insert, plantar fasciitis, very common uh, in, in, in people who are also suffering with myofascial pain. Well, guess what else they can take it from? They can take it from uh, the disc, okay, and uh, you know, perhaps the cartilage of the facet joints. But what about the jelly in the disc? Well, that's just one big glob of proteoglycan. So that's a super good energy source to be mobilized for fight and flight. So we were talking earlier about the repetitive flexion activity causing degenerative disc disease, but there is another phenomenon going on in the body whereby under chronic threat stress, we are taking resources away from those discs and people experience premature disc degeneration, disc dehydration, loss of nuclear jelly material in the disc by taking away these proteoglycans. So I think, I, I mean, I think that's really interesting when we're evaluating uh, uh, degenerative spines. Okay, so let's move away from that and let's go to this next category of neurotransmitters because this is also interesting. So um, let's just talk about what the neurotransmitters do in the spine. So our, our neurotransmitters, particularly we're going to talk about the monoamines, meaning we're taking amino acids, singular amino acids, and building on them to create a neurotransmitter in our body. So for example, 
we take the amino acid tryptophan and put it together and it and it goes into serotonin and then we modify it it goes into melatonin so serotonin is kind of our chill feel good bond connect neurotransmitter melatonin is a neurotransmitter that's very important to the initiation and even the maintenance of, of sleep also you know kind of a nice uh, relaxed dreamy state right so um, uh, those uh, neurotransmitters or melatonin could even be considered a hormone uh, but uh, uh, those monoamine uh, uh, category uh, of neurotransmitters uh, include serotonin and melatonin um, the other uh, ones that are kind of relevant to this discussion are the ones that go through slightly different pathway um, with some commonalities, but uh, dopamine, noradrenaline, and uh, adrenaline. So the monoamines, phenylalanine, and then uh, uh, tyrosine can be converted into dopamine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline, you know, and, and those uh, are also important in the uh, in, in sort of the fight or flight uh, mechanism. So uh, let's let's uh, let's talk about dopamine for just a second here. I've got a little bit of a, a cartoon uh, here, up here and here on dopamine. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter uh, that uh, makes us actually stand upright. Okay, it actually makes us. Um, if serotonin gives us kind of this relaxed, you know, gentle curve in our spine you know kind of chill not a big deal but up, upright but the natural curves dopamine is going to straighten out those curves a little bit we're, we're going to get a little bigger under the influence of dopamine and so dopamine uh, is in some sense kind of our peacock uh, hormone you know a peacock if it's under threat is going to expand its plume to look bigger and more brilliant and more threatening and but also a peacock if it's courting a mate is going to expand its plume to kind of demonst demonstrate some element of confidence and that type of thing so dopamine is a little contextual uh, if we have high dopamine levels under threat we're much more likely to approach and attack and uh, and kind of get after it um, whereas if we have dopamine in a safe when we when we're in a safe environment it still makes us sort of larger and sort of maybe preening is that the right word but um you know uh more sort of open and and socially approaching uh people in an effort to connect and bond and perhaps reproduce um uh, so dopamine has a very direct effect on our spine to make us a little taller chest out a little bigger uh and there's some strategies behind that but we know when dopamine goes low uh, then uh, that posture, that very upright posture, tends to disappear in us. So we had talked a little bit about the protective posture that may be a little bit more related to noradrenaline and what do I do now, there's a tiger there, um, but with uh, dopamine, as dopamine disappears, we tend to get more like this. We're less upright, we're a little smaller, we're in this position. This is really a posture of uh, defeat, of surrender, of submissiveness, uh, of withdrawal. Um, and sort of the classic uh, extreme of dopamine deficiency is Parkinson's disease. It is a disease of dopamine deficiency. And so Parkinson's patients are, you know, frequently stooped or slumped. They're immobile and hypophonic. They have a hard time talking. They're very much kind of in that physiology of surrender, submission, withdrawal, be quiet, hide, don't let the tiger see you type thing. So, do, uh, so dopamine go, goes low, we're gonna slump over. So let's go, let's go down here uh, and talk a little bit about serotonin and melatonin. So we're getting a little theoretical here. But in vertebrates, it still isn't clear to me about humans, but I think we can, in general, sometimes extrapolate from vertebrates. So in vertebrates that uh, you drop their melatonin and serotonin levels, guess what happens to their spine? They get a scoliosis. They get sideways bends in their spine. So they've actually taken in lower vertebrates and, and the pineal gland that secretes a lot of melatonin, 
uh, they, they have been able to take it out, watch the uh, animal get the curve and the sideways curve or scoliosis in the spine, and then they can actually re-implant uh, that tissue and the ones that are more modifiable, perhaps more modifiable than humans, uh, uh, are able to restore a, a straight spine. So I think we have to consider that serotonin and melatonin may be uh, very much integrated into our spine and, uh, and may um, not only have a relationship with degenerative uh, scoliosis, but perhaps also with uh, juvenile and um, adolescent uh, scoliosis as well. Um, so I'm going to throw that out there just to, to think about it. Um, but getting back to the cytokines, what do cytokines do that's so interesting? Well, these uh, pro-inflammatory catabolic and uh, pro-nociceptive uh, cytokines, they affect this cofactor in the synthesis of monoamine neurotransmitters to be able to take amino acids into these feel-good neurotransmitters. Uh, the cytokines block this uh, tetrahydrobiopterin uh, and actually prevent uh, the monoamines from getting to our feel-good neurotransmitters. So that's really interesting. Why would they do that? Well, I think it's also really interesting that the cytokines we're talking about, the, the tryptophans, the phenylalanines, the tyrosines, uh, can be converted and shoved into the Krebs cycle um, and to uh, produce uh, energy. Um, the, these ones particularly seem to be involved in uh, the creation of ketones, perhaps more than glucose, uh, but they are a, an energy source. Okay, there's another weirder thing that happens though. When you take a tryptophan and block it from getting to serotonin and melatonin, it goes down another pathway. Um, and it, it, it goes down the kynurenic pathway, producing something called kynurenine, okay? And this uh, uh, kynurenine uh, it, uh, you, it then gets converted to a couple of different acids, um, kind, uh, uh, urinic acid, uh, most specifically I'm talking about, which has all kinds of wild uh, different side effects. So kind urinic acid blocks uh, one of our relaxation calming neurotransmitters, uh, GABA, uh, gamma amino butyric acid. It blocks its effect. And in addition to that, it blocks the major neurotransmitter for our feed breed, digest, and rest system, acetylcholine at the alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, it blocks that. So this whole process from these pro-inflammatory cytokines affects, infects, effects uh, our neurotransmitter uh, processes to essentially um, make us more irritable or perhaps uh, even uh, depressed uh, over time if they go on chronically. Um, so there's this, this anyway, fascinating uh, physiology just to kind of throw into uh, the mix and, and uh, how our spine looks. So we've now essentially established that the, um, the threat cytokines um, are represented uh, through our myofascial system uh, in myofascial pain, and they are now also represented in uh, the degenerative processes we see in the spine, and they seem to be fascinatingly also represented in uh, the process of deformity in the spine. So we have gone a long way uh, from structural theory uh, into um, you know, hardcore kind of physiology and how it affects the spine and, and neck and, and back pain. And uh, that's something I, I think it's just really cool to contemplate. We need to research this a little bit more. Um, we talked a little bit about the peacock effect and getting, you know, bigger under threat, but also bigger under trying to attract a mate. Uh, and uh, so just to uh, kind of go down that, that evolutionary pathway a little bit more. I want to talk about spiked heels. Okay, where's my guy? Here he is. Okay, so 
<clears throat> when you put on a spike heel, and I'm, you know, most guys don't do that, but um, when you put on a, when women put on a, on a spike heel, what does that do to the spine? So if you take and put some in high heels and jack them up, you actually tip them forward, right? The, the, the heel is tipping them forward. And uh, so in order to get back into a balanced spine, if I've, you know, tipped this thing forward, the natural response is to increase the lumbar lordosis, perhaps even the cervical lordosis, to compensate for being tipped forward. So that takes us out of that really great neutral shock absorbing position, and it overloads these little facet joints in the back of the spine. So people can get, from over compression of the facet joints, they can get an inflamed facet joint, and that can be painful, let alone these have zero shock absorption in them. So you're getting more um, ground reactive forces sort of every time you put your heel on the ground going up your entire body, which isn't really good for any of your joints. Probably not very good with this SI joint now out of its normal alignment. Um, and so you, you can expect more sacroiliac joint, which is just a massive facet joint problems as well as these little facet joint problems. So, um, so why do people put on spike heels? Well, you can hear, well, it makes my legs look longer or, um, you know, I feel more proportioned or, you know, what, whatever. But it, it logically doesn't make a lot of sense. They look horribly uncomfortable on the feet. Uh, they alter our posture. Uh, and, I, and I actually think that the, the reason we are not so far away from the animals that we evolved from uh, and uh, so we talked about the lordotic posture being our kind of chill, relaxed, upright posture. Um, but there is this thing in animal models of increasing the lumbar lordosis to demonstrate um, being sexually receptive. So, and we are wired that way to this day, I believe. So when you take and do this, to a female and tip the pelvis in that direction, it actually is a, a suggestion of receptivity, which our eyes subconsciously, we get uh, attracted to and it becomes a fashion statement. But it is, it is you know, really uh, looks uh, uncomfortable, almost masochistic to put a, a foot into that, uh, let alone what it does uh, to the back. But I just think it's interesting to contemplate why would we do something such as that and how our spines are communicating to people? And we have a lot of facial expression, right? And that's part of our bonding and connecting or, you know, aversive uh, kind of uh, process to, to uh, be able to read somebody's face. We're constantly reading our people's spines and the spines are suggesting to us whether or not they're open, whether or not they're aggressive, whether or not they're perhaps uh, fearful and protective, whether or not they're depressed, whether or not they're relaxed, or even whether or not they might be uh, somewhat uh, sexually receptive. So think about that one. Okay, so let's turn around over here and just run down the list of threats, because this is all about threat, right? And so we have to always contemplate all the different threats we have because they're so vast. And my argument is if you're taking care of people who have neck and back pain and you aren't assessing this list of threats, you're not doing it right. Okay? So threats can be physical, virus, bacteria, parasite, mycelium, fungus, mold kind of stuff. They can be lions, tigers, bears, other people, motor vehicles, perhaps guns. Uh, toxins and radiation can be threatening to us. I put opioids here because uh, they frequently get prescribed for neck and back pain. And we have to remember that opioids are part of the threat stress system. They come out when we've been bit by the tiger. They come out when we've had surgery. They come out in the 15th mile of a marathon. They help us get through something that can be quite agonizing, but they're only designed to be there for a short period to weather that storm until we start to heal. They're not designed to be in our system uh, chronically. And why do I think I'm, they're part of our threat stress system? Because they mimic the physiology of threat and stress, right? We've already talked about under threat and stress, we, set, we shut down the neocortex of the brain, opioids shut down the neocortex of the brain. We've talked about under threat and stress, how uh, we shut off our, our, uh, our bonding and our reproductive system. 
okay? Opioids drop sex hormones. Men on opioids have horrible testosterone levels. They prevent the uh, manufacturing and secretion of oxytocin, the love hormone, also a natural analgesic or a natural pain hormone uh, that uh, allows high oxytocin levels, allow women to get through childbirth without it being excruciating. Um, uh, uh, what else do we do under stress? We shut down our gut. Gastric motility goes down, intestinal motility goes down. We're not as hungry if we're gonna crave anything. It's gonna be a simple carbohydrate. What do opioids do, right? They make us anorexic, we're not hungry. They shut down our colon and we get constipated. They do threat stress stuff. They're part of the threat stress system. In addition to that, the opioids increase the release of the threat cytokines. They are part of the threat stress system. And that's why we have things like opioid induced hyperalgesia, uh, where people who take opioids, when this opioid isn't in their system, they have magnified pain. They've got magnified pro-inflammatory, and pro nociceptive cytokines circulating. Opioids are also catabolic. You know, if you're on high dose opioids for a long time, you're going to see tissue uh, degeneration and you are uh, going to see a loss of uh, muscle mass. Um, and it's undoubtedly through the uh, cytokine system that they're mediating that response. So, opioids because they're part of the threat stress system, if they're used chronically, are a huge threat to us. And we gotta keep that in mind. Now, we're gonna go down real quick, spiritual threats, emotional threats, social threats being isolation, disenfranchisement, discrimination, uh, injustice. Those are kind of our social threats. But probably in that category is financial threat, but poverty in and of itself deserves its own category because that is a significant threat. And we know people who, um, you know, live in poverty, have elevated uh, uh, cytokine levels, and we know that uh, people with elevated cytokine levels are doing more poorly with uh, COVID. In fact, they're, so they're more predisposed to these pain conditions and uh, to degenerative conditions. And then down in the shadows of the brain, we have the predictive codes. And as we've said in past talks, if we have had threat and stress in our life, our codes tend to shift to be more biased towards threat. We've been attacked before. We're gonna be a little bit more aware of things that might attack us in the environment. So those predictive codes, if they're biased towards threat, keep pushing the threat stress button and throwing out this cascade of chemicals, right? Uh, memories, if we have traumatic memories, uh, they can be housed maybe in fragments, maybe incomplete, but they can be housed long-term in our brains and occasionally rise to the surface as a really bad memory, and it will activate the threat stress response. And I should note that, that these memories are housed subconsciously, but they percolate up into consciousness at times, perhaps just in fragments, but they percolate up, whereas these predictive codes tend to just constantly run subconsciously and they never percolate into consciousness, okay? So they're slightly different. And then we have our suppressions and repressions, and these are really important. We go through the day, we have negative thoughts, we don't wanna deal with them, we have aversive emotions, we don't wanna deal with them. We'll compartmentalize those thoughts, we'll stuff those um, uh, aversive emotions, uh, and if we don't get back to them and deal with them and integrate them, they create this energy in the subconscious of the brain that continues to poke on that threat stress button and influence our overall physiology. So these are really important things to deal with in a comprehensive program to take care of people with neck and back pain, particularly myofascial neck and back pain. But as we're understanding it today, also, um, Degenerative and deformity can be very much related to this. So when we see those things, we should be screening these things. And I will also add that um, we know that people have more of these things are more predisposed to autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are just the extension of the cytokine, the pro-inflammatory, pro-nociceptive catabolic cytokine pathway um, to a more significant extreme. So, for example, we know that children who have suffered neglect or abuse um, 
are more likely to have autoimmune diseases. Women uh, who have suffered incest are, you know, um, 30 plus percent more likely to come down with lupus, uh, all mediated through this system that we're talking about. Um, so even the, and the spine has some very specific inflammatory conditions, ankylosing spondylitis clearly has a genetic pattern to it, but is uh, mediated uh, through the cytokine system. Um, psoriatic arthritis and psoriatic spondylitis, um, psor psoriasis is very much a part of this system. So even the true inflammatory spine conditions um, need this explored to adequately treat it. Instead of just throwing the psoriatic on an interleukin-17 inhibitor and saying, see ya, you gotta dig into this stuff if we're gonna really do uh, a good job of treating them. Okay, so let's move on and talk about treatment for neck and back pain. Um, you know, just in, in, in terms of um, um, myofascial pain, with that, it's very important to keep moving. And we've talked about if you're um, not running from the tiger, if you're not actually moving and increasing the blood flow and circulation of the tissues, that's problematic. And most people with myofascial pain will tell you when they're warm or when they're exercising, they actually do feel better. Um, whereas if they have a true mechanical issue, uh, that those types of activities, you know, may aggravate their symptoms, not improve them. So that's part of it, but we can do other stuff too. Uh, a, uh, a good diet um, with uh, heavy bias towards plants, where we are um, uh, fasting overnight for 10 to 12 hours while we're sleeping, which puts us into uh, ketosis. It allows us to burn fat uh, via the the uh, conversion to fatty acids and ketones. And we know that the ketones, when they come out at night, markedly drop our pro-inflammatory cytokines. Therefore, we're less catabolic, less tissue breakdown, and they elevate our anti-inflammatory cytokines, make us anabolic, so we're building tissue. And today, we are learning that that actually affects no susception in our body, right? The pain, the level of pain. So good sleep with that fast, uh, is going to be healing for neck and back pain. So segue right to sleep. We talked about we need seven to eight hours of sleep at night and we need to have a window of fasting on each side of our sleep to really integrate the ketone pathway into the healing process of our body. Uh, we can imagine through all the things we just talked about here with tetrahydrobiopterine and the kynurenic pathway and all that stuff that at night while we're sleeping if we get uh, into uh, kind of deeper stages of sleep and a little bit of ketosis and flip the table on the uh, pro-inflammatory pro nociceptive catabolic cytokines that we're going to be not only secreting more melatonin but producing more melatonin but also producing uh, things like serotonin and dopamine in our sleep. We're restoring everything, our tissues, our brain as a tissue, our neurotransmitters. Um, other things that are really helpful for suppressing pro-inflammatory pro or threat cytokines, the vitamin Bs, I like vitamin B3 in particular, uh, niacinamide or nicotinamide, vitamin C um, does as well, vitamin D, we're, you know, seeing all kinds of things around vitamin D and COVID and obesity and type 2 diabetes. Um, vitamin D suppresses pro-inflammatory cytokines. Always like to take vitamin K with vitamin D, vitamin K2. At least make sure the calcium's getting in the right spots and it's not depositing in the wrong spots. Particularly for pro-inflammatory, we're at high risk for calcium deposition in things like uh, the ligaments of the spine, the arterial walls, places like that where we really don't want the calcium, we want that calcium in the bones. Vitamin um, K2 makes sure it gets in to the right places, but it also drops the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then we get to magnesium. Super, super important to take magnesium just for dropping the pro-inflammatory cytokines, but they also uh, lowers your blood pressure, makes your 
heart less irritable, you're less likely to have an arrhythmia if your magnesium levels are good. Um, the, the, um, the magnesium is really a counterbalance to the inflammatory and pro nociceptive nature of calcium. Uh, it balances out that calcium activity at certain receptors in the body because it competes with them there. Um, so magnesium is super important and we get better bone density when we're taking a combination of magnesium, calcium, vitamin D, uh, and vitamin K. So while we're on bone density, let's talk about osteoporosis briefly. Osteoporosis is a degradation of the bone. It's a degeneration of the bone. What's mediating that? The pro-inflammatory catabolic and pro nociceptive cytokines. The threat cytokines play a major part in osteoporosis. So if you're seeing a woman with osteoporosis, you may also be in somebody, seeing somebody with some back pain, some myofascial pain, some gastroesophageal reflux disease, some anxiety, maybe a little bit of insomnia. And you know, we're inquiring about how much milk she drank when she was a teenager. Um, probably not that relevant, right? It's more to do with whether they're in threat physiology or safety physiology. Okay, let's go to zinc. Zinc's really important for um, enzymes. Um, most of the enzymes in our body, particularly around proteins, we need good zinc levels to chop up pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines, and we need good zinc le levels to actually generate anti-inflammatory cytokines. So you don't want to over, you know, you can take a ton of magnesium and it won't hurt you. Uh, but zinc, you just want a normal level. But when we're under a threat, we burn more zinc, okay? So it's good to make sure that your zinc levels are good. Okay, now the cholinergics. This is something we underutilize. We're, our perception in general is that cortisol is our anti-inflammatory pathway. It's not. Cortisol is part of the, the threat stress response and it's designed to mobilize fuels for the fight and flight. It does happen to have some fairly strong anti-inflammatory properties, and we can argue how that actually plays into the metabolic pathway, um, but that's in a different lecture. Um, but our, our anti-inflammatory pathway is our cholinergic system, okay? And that in, you know, is our vagal system, but the global cholinergic system is our anti-inflammatory system, and we fail to utilize it uh, very well in, uh, in our medical uh, algorithms, okay? So things that um, increase cholinergic activity in our body, um, which is mediated by the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which we talked about over here, uh, that this um, kinurinic uh, acid inhibits the uh, receptors for acetylcholine, are things like phosphatidylcholine, a good fatty acid that's got choline on it that can attach to acetyl-CoA and create acetylcholine. So good healthy fatty acids can increase our, our, uh, our, our, our um, acetylcholine levels. Um, we have uh, a number of drugs that are uh, available. Urocholine is an older one that sits on the col acetylcholine receptors that uh, can have anti-inflammatory, anti threat cytokine properties. Um, uh, Mechelamine uh, is, uh, is an older drug that came back on the market, uh, you know, maybe 2010, that has uh, uh, good cholinergic properties. This is a new one, alpha-7 nicotinic uh, acetylcholine agonists. Uh, there are a number, one, number of them out there that have a very high affinity for the nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptors, and they're already being researched in degenerative processes uh, such as uh, schizophrenia and dementias with some uh, nice success. And I'll point out again here, nicotine. So nicotine, we think of it as being a degenerative kind of chemical causing vascular uh, disease and things like that. And that probably has it, it wrong. It sits on these uh, nicotinic acetylcholine uh, receptors, and we know in the brain that it is neuroprotective. It um, uh, decreases the degenerative processes uh, uh, in the brain, uh, and uh, I suspect it does as well in the body, and maybe is something in extreme cases that it's worth using. It's highly addicting, uh, but um, if it protects the tissues and decreases pain, 
uh, through the uh, acetylcholine pathways, in certain cases it may be very reasonable uh, to look at something like uh, uh, nicotine um, to push back against this tide. It's not as evil as it, when it presents with tobacco, then it causes all kinds of problems. Um, so along those lines of the cholinergic system, we have to talk about vagal stimulation. And remember, uh, decreasing all the threats increases uh, our, our vagal tone, okay? Uh, it, de it increases our, our vagal tone and increases the cholinergic pathways in their activity in the body. But we actually have some vagal stimulators out there. They are implantable uh, through surgery. Uh, they go right on the vagus nerve and stimulate it, and they have some effect in these types of conditions. Um, we have um, superficial or cutaneous vagal stimulation devices that are somewhat effective. We have, um, through different pathways, a vagal stimulation system that goes on the earlobe, and then we have acoustical vagal stimulation strategies that use tones that are soothing to us uh, in, in general to um, activate the vagal system and increase cholinergic transmission and to help us heal. So let's keep those in mind as well. Now let's go to the GABAnergic. So GABA is that neurotransmitter that kind of relaxes us, takes us out of fight or flight. And, uh, and there are some medications that we can use. Again, we talked about the fact that, uh, that uh, the kynurenic acid blocks uh, 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 the GABA system as well. Um, so uh, threat stress blocks this system we uh, can do you know, these safety strategies to activate the system, but we also have some drugs that we typically call you know, the, um, uh, the gabapentinoids, like gabapentin, uh, that uh, seems to be able to control pain, cause some element of relaxation, and we know gabapentin suppresses the threat cytokines. Uh, baclofen works very specifically the spinal cord, and it's one of my favorites, for controlling the muscle tension here, that reflex system that's too jacked up. Uh, so baclofen also suppresses pro-inflammatory cytokines as well as sitting directly on GABA receptors to relax the reflex system and relax the muscle spindles and decrease muscle tension. Um, a, a supplement, the just straight old uh, gamma amino butyric acid probably would help a little bit as well. Um, you know, that can be taken down different pathways and can be reformulated into more of an excitatory neurotransmitter under threat called glutamate. Uh, but it may have a role um, to, you know, provide that substrate through a supplement. And the last one I put though, there are benzos or benzodiazepines. We know that they potently sit on GABA receptors. The problem with them is they tend to be addicting. And so long-term use of uh, the benzodiazepines like Valium is not good, but short-term uh, for anxiety, panic, severe spasm, or severe insomnia, they may be a way to get the flywheel spinning in the right direction. They uh, relax the muscles, they relax the mind, they also decrease pro-inflammatory cytokines. Okay, let's go down here to Prazosin. This is a really interesting one. Prazosin inhibits the uh, alpha-1 adrenergics, okay? So if the beta adrenergic receptors that are heavily populating the heart preferentially keep blood flow to the heart under threat, Prazosin uh, blocks the vasoconstriction effect in the areas that we tend to want to take offline. So Prazosin, like if we're under threat and we're vasoconstricting up in the neocortex, Prazosin may have a very nice property of keeping the blood flow uh, to the cortex. And similarly, Prazosin may also help with keeping the blood flow uh, to these muscles uh, that are involved in uh, the myofascial phenomenon. So I think it's interesting to think about. It calms the fight or flight system. Um, it also relaxes the bladder neck. So in men, if you're getting older and you have to pee all the time at night because your bladder neck's too tight, uh, the tone's too high, uh, it helps with that and that sense of urgency, just an aside. But it, it, and, and it does help people sleep. 
Uh, it's been very helpful for people with post-traumatic stress disorder as well to, to use prazosin. So I would um, throw prazosin into the mix, okay? Um, and then kind of similarly, we have this drug that was brought on the market for spasticity, for too much tone, uh, and it's called tizanidine, uh, and it is a centrally acting alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. So the, the alpha twos are different than the alpha one in fight or flight, and they, uh, and they tend to be uh, more calming. When we saturate the alpha ones, we're really jacked up and jittery and anxious and vasoconstricted. Um, so we found that uh, this alpha two is kind of a bit of a counterbalance to the alpha ones. And so if you give something that acts on an alpha two receptor, you may get more vasodilatation and you get, may get muscle relaxation and you may experience less uh, pain. And this was actually brought on the market, not as a blood pressure medication, but as something to help treat uh, hypertonicity or, or spasticity or spasms in the muscles. So it seems to have a really great role. Um, so, you know, we've kind of gone down uh, from getting the muscle tension to relax to trying to get the blood vessels to dilate, to getting the blood vessels open and relaxing with this one, okay? So those are probably our, our main players in this scenario. Opioids have no role. Um, cannabinoids like cannabis uh, may be appropriate in here. They may help, um, you know, too much THC I don't think is helpful. Um, the CBDs may have a role and may be beneficial in this mix. Um, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen certainly can be uh, helpful, but usually marginally helpful for these type of conditions. Now we're going to get down into the kind of the weirder stuff, the big guns, but I think we have to start considering these things in people who have severe refractory um, uh, myofascial pain, uh, degenerative disc disease, and deformity, that these things actually could have a role. Because this is so much mediated by the threat cytokines, uh, the most uh, sort of inflammatory and catabolic of the cytokines is interleukin-6, in my mind. So an interleukin-6 inhibitor may be appropriate, and there are a number of them on the market. This one here is, happens to be on our formulary at the hospital that I'm at. But also tissue necrosing factor alpha, another threat cytokine, um, uh, an inhibitor of that may also be helpful. Um, we've talked about uh, uh, interleukin-17 uh, inhibitor that's used uh, for psoriasis um, for somebody who has uh, uh, psoriatic uh, spondylitis or you know inflammation in the back associated with psoriasis or even ankylosing spondylitis. You know, arguably this one might be really good. I'm not sure it would be better than that one, but um, there's a little bit of a track record for it. Interleukin-1 inhibitors could have a role. I've always been interested in phosphodiesterase inhibitors um, because instead of just hitting one of these threat cytokines, their activity may dampen all of them together. Um, and so which ones over time, I don't know, but you know, potentially, inter uh, I'm sorry, phosphodiesterase uh, three, four, five, and seven all look like they might have some potential to help with these cytokine syndromes. Um, the phosphodiesterase five type ones are um, the things like Viagra, uh, interestingly. Um, people who have, you know, uh, severe uh, depression uh, and anxiety and addiction are showing some responses to things like ketamine and psilocybin. Uh, and arguably, if we believe that uh, neck and back pain, uh, degeneration and deformity, are all part of the same soup. Somebody who has uh, severe anxiety, depression, PTSD, addiction with neck and back pain, perhaps using the uh, hallucinogens might be helpful. That needs more research, but it's interesting. Naltrexone is, uh, is uh, an opioid antagonist, so it's an opioid inhibitor. And interestingly, there's been studies done uh, in fibromyalgia using low dose naltrexone really helps fibromyalgia. Well, fibromyalgia is a rheumatologic term for myofascial pain. Um, and so, you know, if it's going to help with myofascial pain, it's probably going to help with this entire picture. Exactly how it's working is not clear to me. I would put money on that someplace it's interfacing with the pro-inflammatory 
anthrax cytokine process. And then these other supplements down here are always worth mentioning, glutathione, anacetylcholine, I'm sorry, anacetylcysteine, and alpha lipoic acid have been demonstrated to have, uh, to be able to drop the threat cytokines uh, as well. So this is, this, is, this is kind of the treatment strategy that I would have uh, uh, for uh, addressing neck and back pain is to, you know, heavily um, dig into this. We didn't talk about how you address all this. This, uh, addressing all of these threats uh, is in another session um, under mental health um, and self-care. Um, but this, this is a, a comprehensive approach uh, for uh, neck and back pain. Uh, and as we said, uh, we're including the uh, major cause of neck and back pain, myofascial pain, a non-structural phenomenon, more of a physiologic phenomenon. But we've also tethered into this the fact that, uh, that uh, a degenerative disc and deformity uh, is not just a mechanical and structural phenomenon in the spine. It is also uh, a physiologic phenomenon that directly, that we can directly trace back um, to uh, the threat uh, stress uh, system and that physiology. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you.